Please help spread the message of Frequency Specific Microcurrent by clicking on the like button. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or any podcast app. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. You can find the podcast transcription at FrequencySpecific.com, as well as more information about Frequency Specific Microcurrent. Kevin's on an airplane. Yes. And, and we're here. And you did it all by yourself. Just a couple buttons. It's funny. I can't remember where you guys were, where I was hosting it by myself. And there was a big time change. I remember that. And I remember getting logged out of the account and they were sending Kevin the code. And it was like, whatever time it was. And Kevin's, it's two, three, seven, eight, nine. And I was like, so now my computer accepts the fact that this is happening and there's no codes needed, but we were, we were, prepared. Kevin was on standby. Yay. And all I had to do was click on FSM podcast and it's always the same. You're lucky. I have a couple hoops to jump through to get here. That's always my favorite thing to have in the background. <laughs> I love that. We have a lot to talk about. I have n- no words for what happened this weekend at the advance, even the core was amazing. Yes. And I'm sure the sports, but the advance was like, every time I think it can't get better, it did. And I'm just looking at my notes here. I was thinking, like, we're always thinking on the plane ride home, right? It doesn't matter what conference you go to, you're unpacking what you learned. And then you're thinking how to apply what you learned to your practice and your life and how it's going to fit. And that used to be very confusing. Coming home from the core, I was so inspired, but I'd be thinking, okay, how am I going to use this? And I find that the advance now, there's so many practitioners from so many different backgrounds and professions. And even the ones that you think, okay, I have nothing to do with this you hear a story or there's maybe two minutes or one slide out of their entire presentation that resonates. Juliana Martinson, the electrical circulatory system, she has a way of putting what we do, what we see into, of course, that's the way it happens. Well, right. of course, because the science says this. Right. And then there was that, like the history of electromedicine. And he had, I think, another 30 or 40 minutes worth of talking. I have been telling this lie for 28 years that it all came crashing down in about 1925. And it turns out that they didn't really shut down electromedicine, frequency, whatever, until 1964. So it was going much later than we thought. I I bet you in the 20s, it was probably, it was just peaking. That's what it feels like to me anyways. And then, so that was very interesting. So we saw both ends of the spectrum. We learned about the history and the story that matches the story. And then we learned about where we're at and why it works. And then you have the other side of it. And there's just so much inspiration about where you can take what we're doing into the next steps. So it was very overwhelming. Oh, and then there's David Mesnick, the stable state cubed yeah. sort of thing. The practical part of it that I got to see in the core mm-hmm. was there was a practitioner in the core that had a syrinx in the middle of his thoracic spine that was giving him some trouble. So they did a surgery to drain it. And I guess it was about seven centimeters long. And so they took the roof off of his spinal cord And they put in the kind of little ear tube that you put in a child to drain the fluid out of their ears or open up their ears. Mm -hmm. And oops. Oh, then they put the thoracic spine roof back on. But then the little tube caused transverse myelitis. And then there was some sort of autoimmune thing. Anyway, he's an MD. 
he came in totally spastic from the waist down on two canes or in a scooter. And we started talking about loss of descending inhibition. And we did 81 and 10. And sure enough, so increase descending inhibition in the spinal cord. And sure enough, his legs got soft and the spasticity went down. His Babinski got worse. And I checked with four people who should know and everybody goes, huh? So he takes no meds, no supplements. He's already been through all that. And I said, if we're going to increase descending inhibition, then we need to give you the stuff to make GABA out of. And he said, okay. So I went back to Roger Bellica's Molecules of Behavior and gave him my chewable GABA plus taurine plus P5P in case he can't convert B6. And at the end of three or four days, both knees were bending when he walked mm -hmm. and he wasn't like the Tin Man. And it's who knew that was possible. Right. And this is why I love you so much is because if you're still getting blissfully confused and in awe at what we do, think how we feel. You're welcome. And I'm sorry, <laughs> I use that line so often because it's and true. It just really encompasses everything. And it's funny, I get overwhelmed easy. I will admit that. And I was grateful I had, I have people that know when I come out of the room with that look on my face, I just need a minute to just walk and digest and go to my room and just be like, okay, holy cow. And there are so many moments where I feel like I just have to stand up and just pat my head and be like, okay, there's a little bit of room now and give me more. <laughs> but it was like, there was no break. It was the core. It was the sports. It was Rob Martino. It was the advance. And then it was Jay Shaw at the end, and it, there was no time to come up for air. Oh, Mary Ellen Chalmers. Yes. More than you ever wanted to know about the trigeminal nerve and the skull and the nasal septum. Yeah. I, so this is an example of, I remember very clearly the first time I saw her speak, and that was when the advance had two tracks and you always had to pick one or the other. So thank you very much for not doing that anymore to people because- well, That's your fault because you said, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Everybody needs to see this, whether you're a physical therapist or an MD. Exactly. And it was her talk and she was talking about failed root canals and chronic inflammation in the mouth. And you're thinking, okay, I'm not a dentist. I'm not in functional medicine, but I do treat concussions and I do treat a ton of flexion extension injuries. And in my world, we would always treat the jaw for concussion and flexion extension. So I thought I might want to hear this. And she didn't talk anything about TMJ, but talking about mouth inflammation, when you've got this inflammation in your mouth, it's robbing your body of fighting inflammation and infection elsewhere. And to me, that was just that sentence alone changed everything. It accelerates inflammation everywhere. If right. you have somebody that has either an autoimmune condition, chronic digestive problems of what do you call it? An idiopathic frozen shoulder, which is caused by inflammation. The first question when you see all those things in one history was, is, do you have any root canals? Right. And everybody went, what? How? What does that have to do with my shoulder? And now it's, do you have any root canals? Do you have mold? Where did you live? When did you live there? Oh, there was mold in the house, but I don't have mold. And it's like, how do we know that? Mm -hmm. You mean mold can live in my body, in my sinuses, in my bronchi, in my digestive tract? And it can turn down the vagus and the vagus stops turning down inflammation. And that's why I have a frozen shoulder and hip pain. 
excuse me? I know. And you're just like, uh-huh. <laughs> but it is patient education and it's terrifying, right? And it, you can see the anxiety pop up with patients when you're telling them to go down their childhood paths of the wet basement and all those things. And they have no idea that could still affect them today. So I think it's also wise to follow up with a quick, and Jen Sosnowski and right. Dr. Musnick and I were sitting at lunchtime and they were talking about all this stuff and they both had the exact same philosophy of you dig and you dig and you ask the questions and they get all scared and they get all worked up, but you say, but it's okay because now I have this information, I can fix you. And see, I don't find it terrifying. Patients don't get scared. It's okay. okay. She's asking me this. She appears otherwise sane. And so in, I don't find them to be scared. They right. end up relieved that, oh, this didn't come from space. So for 12 years, they've been telling me this came from space. It just fell on me. Sorry, idiopathic means we don't know where it came from. And it's not exactly that we don't care, right. but there's nothing we're going to do about it anyway. Right. So have a nice life. When you start asking questions, so that's how the advance changed this year. Yes. Everybody has to just get used to the idea that I am never, ever going to get through all the slides. So there's this whole first section that was follow the clues. Yeah. Follow the clues. And the clues are this goes with that. And then you see all these things in one place. You have them put their hand on the desk and raise their little finger to 95 or 100 degrees. And then you say, let me see your elbows. Did you know you had Ehlers-Danlos or hypermobility syndrome? What's that? That's the reason that you have shoulder and arm and leg pain. Excuse me? Yeah. I, it was really fun. I think the big take home, again, just piggybacking what you just said with all the practitioners from all the different spectrums, is that validity that we give to patients. Because I think the longer that you practice, especially the longer that you practice with FSM, the patients that you see have been dismissed not believed, left to fend for themselves, not given any explanation other than you're old, it's normal, like all these reasons, which are to me, just super lazy responses. The one that gets me is learn to live with it. Excuse me. So funny that you mentioned that I started the sports advanced with a, a screenshot and I'd put this slide in super last minute, like 10 minutes before the course started something I saw on, on Instagram from a orthopedic surgeon that I quite like his content. And there was a piece on tennis elbow and he's, you can get treatment or you can just live with it. You could get treatment or it'll go away by itself. And it was just like therapy does nothing. It, it don't wear a brace or don't, it makes no difference. And I was so upset reading that because it is that dismissive. I don't know. It's just dismissive. And to dismiss somebody who is in pain, who is trying to lead an active lifestyle, I have a huge problem with that. And true. I have trouble with it. Those, that's the part where I just cover my mouth. But when you look at it from the MD's perspective, the orthopedic surgeon's perspective, he has no tools. Sure. They, they don't. They would help if they could, yeah. but they have a couple of problems. One is they don't know how to think about it. So is there ever a time when tennis elbow is not C6 or C7 in some way? So he has no way to treat nerve pain. Is there a way for him to repair a partial thickness tendon tear in one of the flexor muscles right. no we can it's easy nerve pain for us that's easy yeah and i don't think there's anybody else that's the other thing we had to take home with was we can treat them at the same time so if you're an fsm practitioner 
is this pain right here a tendinopathy or is that the C6 nerve root? It doesn't matter because you put 40 and 396 and you do 124 and 77 torn and broken in the, because it's a flat tendon wad. Yeah. Do both. I have chocolate and vanilla. And they, we can do both. And I think the physicians who do the dismissing just don't have a way of looking at it and they don't have the tools to treat it. And that's what makes FSM practitioners different. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It, it just reminds me of one of the slides. It was like from the core a long time ago, treat this and this because you can. And I remember just sitting about that and it was like, treat the dura because you can. I'm like, huh, look at us doing that stuff. And that is, that really does encompass the, you're welcome. And I'm sorry, because you are so grateful for all this knowledge and this new way of thinking. And the, I'm sorry, because I know you're completely overwhelmed and it looks like you're about to like. And it gets less overwhelming. I think this is the first time Jay Shaw's presentation was completely different than it's ever been. And I don't know if it's because he's used to us and he knew how to tailor the new discoveries and the research to our world. Yeah. Or if it's because the new discoveries and the research are finally catching up with us. Right. So usually I'm up with a microphone for at least a third of his lecture. And this time he's talking about Peripheral nerve sensitization, spinal cord sensitization, limbic system sensitization, and ATP, and all of that. And I think I got up maybe twice, and I just had to translate. Actually, I didn't translate. I was explaining to Jay. I said, this is why now when we treat muscles, the first thing we treat is the nerve. Yeah. And he just looked at me. And then we treat the cord. Yeah. And we treat central sensitization. And we treat the physical underlying drivers, whether it's inflammation in the small bowel or an ovarian cyst. I was surprised to see, what did he have? Five or six slides with an ovary. Right, the fallopian tubes and ovarian cysts. We do that. That's trigger points in the left lower obliques. Right. So there's research that it doesn't back up what we do, but it explains why when we treat myofascial pain, we never touch the muscle. Yeah. What's wrong with the muscles? It's the nerves. It's the cord. It's the. And that was the hardest thing to hear as somebody in physical medicine who does training, who does manual therapy, and you hear it's never the muscle. And you're like, excuse me. So why am I here? I have nothing to do because all I treat are muscles and just forget it. And then you're like, oh, now I get it. The muscle is never the driver, right? It's always reacting to something. And the more successful you are at FSM is when you start thinking, how did it get, what is the driver? How did it get like this? And I think the group of sports course attendees, it was so exciting because I too am hitting them with that right out of the back. Like, how did it get like this? Don't accept that it is tight. Don't accept that it is inhibited. Ask the other questions. Why would it be inhibited? Why would it not move? Where could it be scarred? Why could it be scarred? And you just see it happening. Yeah. So, it's so cool. The light bulbs go off. Yeah. Yeah. It ended up being the perfect lineup. And then Sunday morning, we had the case reports. Yeah. What people are doing with this is just extraordinary. Dave right. Burke's case report. Right. He explained what spina bifida is, the different types of it. And we used to find out there was spina bifida when the child was born. And 
now they are finding spina bifida when the fetus is in utero and at 21 weeks i think they go into the uterus and they push the little spinal cord back where it belongs and then they sew up the defect so that the child is born with some neurologic bowel and bladder deficits but he's not in a wheelchair for the rest of his life i know and then Dr. Burke showed video of a child who had this surgery, was now two, 18 months or two years old, and you treat the nerve and the dura and the cord, right? It's not that hard. And the strength improved. And I think after four sessions, he has a video of the kid walking, holding on to mom's fingers. And yeah. Okay. I know the videos were amazing to watch because anytime with the case reports, when I can see pictures or videos, it humanizes the whole experience. And yes, we're scientists and we're data driven and we love that. But when you can see it in action, to me, that's when you're just like, oh yeah, there's a human story at the other side of this and you are improving their quality of life. And that's an amazing thing to be a part of. That's where we go to the slide that I put in. It's like, just change one life. Yeah. Uh, you start when you get home from yeah. the cord yeah. and do what you can. And even if you only succeed in changing one life, you change the world. Mm -hmm. And then I got in everybody's face and said, and if you're not here to change the world, what are you here for? Okay. Oh, don't scare me. I don't want to change the world. I just want to treat patients. What? No, but that's why we're doing this, right? It's amazing. From the athletes to the kids that are not in wheelchairs, the whole spectrum is all packed in one weekend. And that's why it is overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. And so the core had 33 or 36 practitioners. And the amazing thing about the core is on the fifth day, after I finish at 6.15, the visceral slides, a half of the class, I said, do you want to do a practicum? They all hit the tables. Yeah. They were there until 7.30 after five days of never getting out of there before 7.30. Yeah. So they form this community and then you take that forward to the advanced where we had I think 120 in the room and another 60 online and the community of enthusiastic passionate caring hilarious FSM prep what a tribe it's no. not the best family reunion ever and let me just say something really quick on that. I have never had deeper connections with people I've literally just met than with the FSM community. It is so bizarre to me to sit at a table and feel like I've known these people my entire life. And I've only just recently met them in the last five, 10 years. And I only physically see them once a year and sometimes don't talk to them for an entire year, but feel like they're family. Oh, absolutely. And then we had practitioners from Belgium, Poland, Italy, Chile, and Ireland. Did I miss? Besides all over the US. Yeah. But wow. Okay. I know. Amazing. I'm excited. I yeah. Just, it's just growing and growing and growing in the right ways. With the right people doing the right stuff. I heard a quote. I'm taking another course right now. On, <laughs> but there was a quote and it, when you hear something and it just gets a hold of your heart and it just sits there. And the quote was, and this is the, the quote for today. And it's not really a quote quote, but the quote was, you are right on time. Yes, always. And sometimes we're trying to speed things up and we're trying to 
speed up a treatment or we're trying to teach something to practitioners in a different way, or we wish things would be bigger or progress faster. And it's no, everything you are right on time. You're right where you're supposed to be. And I am trying to just really enjoy where we're at right now because it is the excitement is palpable at these conferences. So and everybody's like bouncing in their chairs saying what's next. What's next right now are some questions probably. <laughs> Let me do one more thing because if we get onto the questions, it's going to fall out of my brain and I might never find it again down here on the desk. We had Karen Perry. Yes. The paper that was published on reducing oxalates and breast density um, and the reviewer's comments that reducing breast density and oxalates by this much in such a sh like short period of time, like a total of three hours of treatment or four hours of treatment over 18 months, reduce this woman's chance of getting breast cancer by something like 50%. Oh. And so we have the published paper and I handed Karen the check. I'm serious about bribing you all to published papers. And then Candace Elliott came up and she is so organized. She scares me. She intimidates me. And she's got, she goes through all the steps. And at the end, she has this beautiful checklist of things to have in order. And for people whose brains work that way, you can do it that way. And she looked horrified when I said, if I had to do that checklist, I would never ever in my life write a paper. Yeah. I pick a pick the topic, I have my data, I go to the journal that I think might publish it, and I look at the guidelines for authors, and they tell you what the headings need to be, how many words you get. And then I ask a room of 120 people. Did you ever have to write a term paper in high school or college? Every single one of them raised their hand. I said, okay, it's exactly the same process. So whether you love the checklist or don't love the checklist, you can publish the cases or a case or multiple cases in whatever way suits you. It's like how you use FSM. How intuitive are you? How physical are you? How does your brain work? How right. do you like looking at the clues or do all the clue possibilities overwhelm and scare you and you want to do it in order this way? Okay. Because either way, it's going to work. I had the question at the sports course, how much of this is data-driven and how much of this is intuitive? And I said, yes. And they're like, but I'm like, no, the answer is yes. And that's what I mean. If you need range of motion, which I do, I need to know things are improving. I feel the patient needs to have a metric to feel. If they get dwarfed, great. If they feel smush, great. It's not needed. And neither is my response to what's happening. So yes, I think anybody who's been practicing anything for a while, there's a certain amount of whatever you want to call it, gut feeling, intuitiveness, instinct, whatever. And so much of in intuition is experience and yeah. pattern recognition. That was the other thing I hammered home in yeah. the advance was pattern recognition. The first time you ever see an 81 and 10 patient of well, the first four times, you're going to miss it. Right. Now, at least you've heard that it's a thing. So as you're touching somebody, as you're palpating somebody, you check the tone in their legs and you might miss it the first two times. Yeah. But the next time, oh yeah, I've heard about that someplace. We have, I have a frequency for that. And the, rain, the range of motion, right? Both are important yeah. and they feed on each other. Yeah. So is pattern recognition intuition or is pattern recognition accumulated factoids? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> I was hoping that would make sense. It made sense in my head. No, but you're absolutely right. But 
what, like I said, one is not derivative or necessary than the other. So like I said, I have some athletes that'll be like, oh, my buddy has this custom care and he gets all floaty when he runs it. And I can't wait to experience that. I'm like, that's not necessarily going to happen for you. What? I'm like, it's not a guarantee that you're going to feel like that. And it doesn't mean that your treatment isn't effective if you don't feel like that. And so that's the same that I get. Sometimes there's zero intuition. I'm totally lost. I have no idea if this is working, but then I go back to my range of motion and be like, Hey, look at that. It, it did improve. And we are on the right track. And some patients are super stoic. So pain scale isn't necessarily anything that's going to move the needle, but your range of motion or your sensory exam or whatever will. So I am grateful for FSM education because it's more than just the numbers. It's more than a recipe. And it is more than a way of thinking. It's all of it wrapped up. You've given us so many tools. I feel like I need a new tool belt to put in all the tools. Yeah, um, an extra section of your brain that works a little bit differently to see the connections. Yes. The short version is everything's connected to everything. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. right. And before we get to the questions, another little point of gratitude that I think a lot of us found very exciting was seeing David Suzuki there and talking about the devices and the intent and the quality that is behind it. So I think it was very rewarding for the practitioners that were there to put a face to the devices and hear a little bit more about their creation and that story. So I think that was a very nice add to have them there. It was really so wonderful for me. It's the first time he's volunteered. I didn't ask him to come. He said, hey, we can come. We can replace faceplates and I'll just come. Well, and he and his wife sat through the almost the entire advanced. Yes. They had a plane to catch. So they left at one o'clock. Yeah. Just, just as Jay Shaw was. So they sat through the lectures yeah. and they got to meet our community. And I got to tell everybody, which kind of cracked him up. The only reason FSM exists is that, Dave, that I was able to talk David Suzuki into letting us buy their graphite gloves. Because back in the very beginning in 96, 97, we used graphite gloves on our hands yep. to treat patients. And uh, they only sold the graphite gloves with their cosmetic devices. Right. And so thank, being able to thank him, gratitude is the beginning of everything. So it's pretty fun. It is the beginning of everything. Yes. Big nugget. Okay. <laughs> get to some questions. I'm still on like information overwhelm right now. Dana asks, Oh, sports question. Okay. Is exercise induced vomiting normal for some people or, or could what they think is normal actually be a vagal tone issue? That is a very good question. So exercise induced vomiting can occur from a multitude of things. So some people will say it's super normal for some people we hear about this a lot, like athletes, depending on the sport, don't like to train on an empty stomach because they'll vomit. And that could be from exertion. That could be from sympathetics. That could be from lactate. That could be from a host of things. So it's hard to say. I would question what activity it is. And if it's a constant, if they're always throwing up, no matter when they eat or what type of threshold they're training in, that that could be a GI dysfunction too, right? Or it could be a vagal tone. The only people I've seen vomiting with exercise were at track meets. Sure. So the guy that wins gets across the finish line, pulls over onto the grass and throws up. Sure. Some people get agitated before a game, football okay. players who shall remain unnamed. And it's, it's almost like the good luck thing for the team. Sure. It's like he throws up before every game and every time he throws up, we win. Have you thrown up yet? Yeah, but that would be exercise induced though. Like they're not exercising before the game. So something that's happening during training, I've seen 
many people throw up in the gym lifting weights. If so, Charles Poliquin had the German body comp workout. And when that was very popular, that's bring, shunting blood. You do a lower body exercise and then an upper body exercise and a lower body and upper body. And there's no break. And then that's like that lactate level. So I wait, what makes them think it's lactate? I don't know. Okay. I think it's Vegas and synthetics. Because if you're being chased to the jungle by a tiger. Yeah. Why do you need your stomach? Yep. Exactly. So let's get rid of the dead weight that's in my stomach. There's no blood there. The vagus is now shut off because I'm so exhausted and so sympathetic dominant. Yeah. I think I'll barf and then everything will be better. Totally. Yeah. I I can wrap my brain around that for sure. But I said, I would always just question when it's happening. If it's during aerobic activity, is it happening? Just weightlifting? What is the volume and the threshold like? Because it could actually be a GERD sort of response. Okay. I hate to do this, but GERD is vagal too, because yeah. the vagus controls the lower esophageal sphincter yeah. and the pyloric sphincter. The stomach, when the vagus is on, the lower esophageal sphincter closes, hence barfing is not possible. Yeah. And the pyloric sphincter empty, opens, so the contents of the stomach go down instead of up. So that's when the vagus is working. Right. If you're going to vomit, the pyloric sphincter has to be closed and yeah. the lower esophageal sphincter has to be open. And sometimes, so yeah, back- yeah mm-hmm. the vagus has got to be in it. Yeah, there it is. It's the vagus. It's always a vagus. <laughs> yeah. Well, like it's never the muscle and it's always the vagus. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Leaf. Yeah, it was Hi, so you in person as well it was so cool to see him yeah in person I didn't realize he was so tall Levy is very tall I had to really reach up for a big hug yes yeah. it was um, great Michelle writes patient on meds for GERD oh here we go frequent vomiting what's up with the vomiting questions okay <laughs> on meds for GERD frequent vomiting and food sensitivities colonoscopy came back clear yet the procedure itself seemed to cause an immediate reaction of pancolitis, extreme bowel oh. reaction. No oh, fooling. Imagine my surprise. A nightly concussion slash Vegas protocol could relieve symptoms as they stated problems started after the loss of a loved one. Wondering if Vegas concussion is okay to use if they had a complete thyroidectomy in 98. Hard sure. to believe there was no complications from that. The only reason they take out the thyroid completely is either thyroid cancer or thyroid cancer. Right. Or thyroid may be completely out of control Hashimoto's where the thyroid is in the hyper state and the medication didn't work and the patient's heart rate was 103 and they were hot and nothing worked. And the thyroid wasn't burning itself out fast enough. So my understanding is the hot phase of Hashimoto's where the thyroid is inflamed, it produces too much. It's an autoimmune thing. And then the thyroid burns out and then you become hypo. So when somebody says they have Hashimoto's, okay, which end of it are you in? Yes, 98 was a long time ago. But on medication for GERD, that means there's no stomach acid. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other conversation. Frequent vomiting, yeah. Food sensitivities. Now, here's the thing. Check my anatomy. GERD and vomiting happen at the top end, Mm -hmm. right? Colonoscopy is at bottom end okay good just wanted to check because you should have had an endoscopy so they did a colonoscopy and the colonoscopy caused i took four years of latin so that i could learn to break words into two parts (laughs) colitis is really bad inflammation in the colon 
and pancolitis means it's the whole colon. So extreme bowel inflammation reaction. So here's the thing. You step back and has anybody ever looked at the prep that is standard of care for a colonoscopy? The product that is in that prep is polyethylene glycol. And there's many different preps out now. I just had a colonoscopy and I could choose from three different, but maybe it all has the same. I don't know. I had, I told them I knew from a vaginal medication that they gave me for a yeast infection that polyethylene glycol dissolves my tissue. Like it was bad. And so if the patient was sensitive to polyethylene glycol, and if the most common prep is PEG, yeah. and so was it the colonoscopy? All they do really is inflate your colon with air, go in and look around with this flexible scope. But the prep is 24 to 48 hours of cleaning out everything that's in every square inch of your colon. So if they were sensitive or allergic to the prep, I'm thinking that's what caused the, is more likely to have caused the colitis. So the concussion in Vegas would help, but treat the colon. They poison, inflamed, irritated, and possibly remove the mucus lining to the large intestine, at least the descending colon. Mm -hmm. So yes, after the loss of a loved one, concussion in Vegas makes perfect sense, but for heaven's sakes, treat the colon, Michelle. That's where I'd go. Yeah. Alf, I don't know what to do about it, so live with it. Yep, that's what they say. It. Yes. All right. Another question, comment, Debbie. Debbie says, thank you so both so much. The seminars changed my world. I did the core in the advance in 2020. I adopted Carol as my crazy aunt Carol. <laughs> yes, she's many crazy family members to us. <laughs> I was nudged by the little Carol bird to join the seminar and it has absolutely changed my world. And now I eat, sleep and breathe FSM again. That is amazing. So you're welcome and I'm sorry. <laughs> But it sounds like you're very happy, Debbie. So that's the main thing. That's the nice thing is almost everybody that's doing FSM appears to just be obsessed with it. Or maybe those are just the people that come from all over the country and around the world to be at the seminar. I would agree with you. But I also am seeing and hearing about people who did the core in like 2000, 2001, and then got super disgruntled with it and didn't even, bad. and now somebody that they know is using it and they're like I think I should take this course again I'm like okay I, I'm hearing that from the sports performance side of things oh yeah we've heard of FSM for a while but we just didn't like wasn't really sure but now more people are doing it and maybe I should take a course and I'm like yes you should because it's different now it is totally different now so for the people that took the instructor course on Monday I rewrote the slides on the way home on the plane Tuesday. <laughs> Just so you know, I'll send them out. What's fascinating to me is that it's not just our community. So one of the practitioners said that I think it's her mom was having cardiac surgery. And so open heart surgery, valve replacement or something. And the practitioner asked, a cardiothoracic surgeon. I want you, want you to just process that picture. A cardiothoracic surgeon. I do frequencies, I do microcurrent, and I want to be able to treat my mom right after surgery in ICU. 15 years ago, no way. And the cardiothoracic surgeon said, oh, microcurrent, that thing with the frequencies. Yeah, that heals blood vessels and bone. 
Oh, absolutely. So he wrote in his orders. So the practitioner is in ICU with her mom. And the nurse comes in and says, visiting hours are over. And the doctor's there. And he said, she's not visiting. She's working. And mom developed a bleed. They had a leak. There's a little stitch that didn't quite catch. And mom started bleeding and her blood count dropped and her pulse went up and all of the things that happened. And the practitioner sat there for three hours and ran the frequencies to stop bleeding in the arteries and the heart and the capillaries. And three hours later, because they were prepping mom, they were scheduling the OR if the bleeding didn't stop. And three hours later, the bleeding was stopped. The blood count was back to normal. Pulse was back down. Everything was good. She didn't need a surgery. Yay. Wow. Yeah. And that's just one story I know out of just so many. Isn't that cool? It, yes. And like I said, it's overwhelming when you're in it for the week. And I can't imagine how you feel because I was just getting a small dose of Kim, I have to tell you this story. Kim, I have to tell you this. And so the questions and the stories are coming at you. And there is like that moment where I was just like, wow, because I have a solo practice and I don't get the people to bounce this off of on a day to day. It's just me and the person. And that is a very special connection. And like I was saying before, like the connections you feel with practitioners are so strong because there's this uniqueness about our community that it's like a secret society, right? We're talking code, like we're hard to find sometimes, but you have that and you had talked about it two advanced ago. I want to say that's special thing that happens. It's the only place when you consider all of the meetings that you can possibly go to, it's it's such a broad spectrum of medical licensing from massage therapists to DOs to PTs to OTs to RNs to MDs to orthopedic surgeons to PM&R to trainers to all of it. So it's such a wide range. But the thing I used to say is it's the only meeting you go to where you feel normal. Yeah. <laughs> where you can say it wasn't that hard. It was just a 40 and 396 and a 40 and 10, but I had to run 81 and 10 at the same time. And then she was all freaked out. So I did 40 and 89. We ran concussion in Vegas and in an hour she was out of pain. And it's or well, on the planet said she just had earlier stand Because that just not that hard. <laughs> I know that is, it's amazing and, and overwhelming and simple and it's all of it. And I think some of the things that you say, like when you get overwhelmed, what do you do? You just do the next thing. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, before yeah. this where the time is doing its thing, the story about we need published papers and case reports and all of that. The thing I come away with after looking at this group as is what do we need what can we provide this community so I've been browbeating about published papers and there's Candace in our list and there's me with your term paper yeah and we ended up with three or four people who volunteered to mentor practitioners who want to publish case reports. Wow. And that led to me finding Kevin at a moment where he wasn't overwhelmed, which is a little tricky, and say, could we create a tab on the practitioner page that says publish papers, interest, right? Yeah. And you can pick one of the four people to be your mentor. And it'll have Candace's list as a checklist as, and it's not Candace, it's a standard checklist for publishing papers. So you have the checklist or we can have a more free form checklist. So you can have both versions 
and help practitioners make those cases a reality because there's a real benefit, not just for FSM, but for the practitioner and the patient. FSM, that was the other thing that came out is somebody said, my dream is for FSM to be standard of care in every ambulance and every ER and every post-operative care unit. And they just went down the list. And it's the only way to do that is to get enough papers. And we also have to wait for enough people to die because we're talking about a profession that took 50 years to learn to wash its hands. Right. So it's, it takes patience mm -hmm. and it takes persistence and integrity. I keep coming back to this integrity thing. We have to do it right. There's no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. There's no, oh, if I just put it on TikTok, oh God, please don't. Yes, that gets the patients. But are the patients that are looking for practitioners, that section of our website already gets 100,000 hits a year, over 100,000. It's about 120. There's only 2,100, 2,500 FSM practitioners in the U.S. There's 4,000 worldwide, but there's 2,000, and there's 100,000 people looking for an FSM practitioner. Do the math. you got a lot of people stalking you, right? So <laughs> true. Yeah. So if you put it on TikTok or you put it on an interest group page and we increase the number of people that are looking for practitioners, then that means we have to make it easier for people to take the core online and then train more instructors. So I have to do a better job about that, which is why I rewrote the slides on the way home. And, it, and it's just do the next thing. Yeah. It is exciting being us right now. I will say that it is. I just, I just love being us. Yeah. And it is. Again, I'm just still flying high off of the advanced and the inspiration, I guess. Like, it was just such an inspiring time to connect with people. And it is great that we do offer the online part and you do absolutely get all the knowledge and all the slides and all the content. But I really just love being at the facility that we're at. The hotel is fantastic. They always take care of us. They're good people. The food is amazing. And I really just love the lunchtime conversations. The seminars are great, but the lunchtime hallway conversations are amazing. We had this year, the first day was a free for all. Pick a table, see the people you want to yeah. learn to talk to. And the next day, thanks to Candace Elliott, we had special interest group tables. Mm -hmm. So there's a group that wants to pursue PTSD research. And there's a group that wants... They had Ehlers Danlos, they had fibromyalgia, they had mold. And the special interest group puts people together by according to the things that they treat and they have an interest in. Yes. And that's another, we just, it's our tribe. It's a big family reunion with great lunch meat food. Yes. Yeah. The food is amazing. I, I think I always gain about five pounds while I'm there because you're just like eating and sitting in the sun and you're just like happy and no one's racing anywhere. You can just rest and digest, right? It's <laughs> and everybody's happy. So yeah, if you are a practitioner and you are listening and you have yet to attend the advance in person, it is worth the price of admission. And that's just such a fantastic experience. Yeah. There was just no words. I was hoping you'd find things to talk about because when I got dressed to come in here and I had to put my FSM sweatshirt on with my logo someplace, I don't have any words because it's just amazing. And I loved hearing the feedback about the podcast because there are some episodes that when I click off, I'm just like, did we talk about any, anything? <laughs> What did we just talk about for an hour? Was it like just two friends on the phone? And people were just so appreciative of the podcast and 
So I'm glad that it's actually informative because you and I have a ton of fun doing them, but I'm not sure that it's actually helping sometimes. But if we can pick one or two topics, I think we're doing, I, I feel like that because I have this list and I plan, I have all the stuff in place and the things I want to talk about. And we barely scratch the surface in the hour. The hours over, we did the same thing in person, sitting yeah. next to each other. It was so cute. David Eeks was like, that was unbelievable to watch you guys. Like it was unscripted, but it seemed like it was so planned out and it was so natural and it flowed. And I'm like, we have been doing this for 125 episodes or something already. It's organic. It's how we end up just so you feel better. I know you have this list. You know how I am about lists, but we, we have this list, but just talking about what goes with what the we did talk about treat the nerve treat the joint treat the muscle treat the cord treat the brain that's a lot right. right there and there are some practitioners out there maybe who are saying what you say <laughs> what how i'll have to go look that up yeah it's treat the vegas yeah would you treat the vegas that's the vegas webinar specific.com backslash webinars thanks to kevin and he's on a plane so he doesn't have an opportunity to get all embarrassed thanks to kevin we have and to stellar uh graphics the company that redid the front end of our website we have so many resources for practitioners where if you're interested in being a better practitioner, you can look it up. Yeah. And now on the Buddy Plus, there are all sorts of resources. Yes. So it's keeping on. Is, is it really five after? It is. Well, a few minutes after. Two minutes. Oh, good. Not yeah. bad. <laughs> We're right on time. That is exactly what... I was going with. So here we go. Everybody for letting us debrief from another advanced and our brains will be back in our bodies um, next week. And we will see you all then. We we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.